Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 148th New Social Environment. I am Nick Bennett and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Jeff Orlowski and Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky. We're also thrilled to have the poet Lawrence Griffin here who will read to close today's program. And now to introduce today's host, Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky is a composer multimedia artist and writer whose work immerses audiences in a blend of genres, global culture, and environmental and social issues. Miller has collaborated with an array of recording artists, including Metallica, Chuck D, Steve Reich, and Yoko Ono. His 2018 album, DJ Spooky Presents, Phantom Dance Hall, debuted number three on Billboard Reggae. Paul is also an editor-at-large at the Brooklyn Rail. And our guest today, Jeff Orlowski, is the director, producer, and cinematographer of the award-winning films, Chasing Coral and Chasing Ice. Chasing Coral received the US Documentary Audience Award at Sundance in 2017. Chasing Ice received the Documentary Cinematography Award at Sundance in 2012, and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Song. Both films were shortlisted for an Academy Award for Best Documentary, screened at Congress and the United Nations, and have garnered awards and accolades from film festivals around the globe. Jeff founded Exposure Labs, a production company dedicated to impact through film. His latest film, The Social Dilemma, had its world premiere at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and is part of the topic of today's conversation. So without further ado, I hand the microphone over to today's host, Paul Miller. Over to you, Paul. All right. Um... First and foremost, it's an absolute pleasure to um, check in with Jeff about his new film. I'm a huge fan of his work um, and his films uh, previously had focused mostly on environmental issues, which is also quite close to my heart. Um, so what I'd like to do today is build a premise that I think that film is one of the most powerful narrative tools we have right now for storytelling to give people a sense of some of the dangers that social media have been uh, kind of unleashing on us algorithmically and all sorts of other kind of uh, strategic, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of monetization of, of the human attention span. So Jeff, um, can you, I'd love to just begin the conversation with a little bit of context. Um, can you give us a little bit of your journey from environmental film on over yeah. to the um, other material you're doing? Yeah, awesome. Um, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, it's so great. We've been like playing phone tag all summer and trying to meet up and hang out. It's great to connect uh, through this. And thank you, Nick and Brooklyn Royal for, for hosting. Um, yeah, Paul, to your question, I think um, I've always just been interested in the big issues affecting humanity and affecting society and was kind of offered the, uh, the opportunity to make Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, those projects that, um, that uh, that focus on, in my mind, one of the biggest issues facing humanity, climate change. And it was in that process when I started to learn about what technology is doing to society. And one of our subjects, Tristan Harris, references it as a climate change of culture, that our technology is actually invisibly, programmatically affecting the way human culture interacts and relates with each other. And when I was realizing the connecting of the dots and the, his framing and his thinking, and then got to meet many, many more experts working on this, um, it, it really crystallized for me. One of our subjects, Kathy O'Neill, she says, algorithms don't predict the future, they cause the future. And when you think about the asymmetric power that these, um, these massive tech companies have now, the amount of data that's being collected on us, the amount that they know about us, and what those algorithms are being used for, it's that last gap around what's the intention and the purpose and the usage of this really, really powerful machine learning algorithmic technology. Um, that's where it, it really just aligned for me around there was a huge story to tell here. There's a huge process for me to go through in terms of learning and understanding um, and then trying to take all of that and distill it down into a film. So the social dilemma is the attempt to um, <laughs> distill the countless, countless amazing conversations that our team has had and learned from uh, and try to make it accessible to the general public who's not typically thinking about, you know, what exactly is a machine learning algorithm. 
Well, let's unpack some of that because I think for the audience, there's always a sense that um, we live in a time where we're based mostly on what most people would now call the attention economy. Yes. And we've moved out of this notion of the, the consumption of physical goods, although that's still a component of the global economy. But the, the basic premise that makes Apple, for example, one of the largest corporations in human history, um, and def- certainly the most valuable, is the kind of subscription-based, attention-based model. Um, one could argue they've moved from a perfect example of moving from physical products to digital services. And those digital services, much like Amazon, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, they're all based on this um, kind of monetization that we were talking about earlier. So, so Jeff, let's unpack um, some of the yeah. issues because many of the people you have in your film are some of the same people who helped let, lead us to this point. And there's yeah. a crisis in democracy right now because right. to have, a, to have a, a functioning democratic nation state, you need to have an informed populace. So, for example, recently Facebook just removed QAnon from their forums, right. and and even yesterday, the governor of Michigan, who was um, there, was an attempt to assassinate and or um, kidnap her by people who had been um, catalyzed by social media. So, I didn't um, see that story. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's she she made a big press conference about how they had been radicalized using social media for white supremacy, and then it's pretty. I mean, this is it, the only I think couple more days to the election man it's going to get buckle yeah. up so <laughs> yes um, buckle so. up is right <laughs> and twitter just announced about an hour ago new policies around intentionally trying to add friction into the system which is uh is pretty unprecedented because so much of this has always been around like eliminate friction let things spread as virally as possible um twitter is now trying to take a, a very commendable stance around trying to use the 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 software to slow things down um, which is a great step, a step in the right direction. So let's talk about your, your, your philosophy of cinema, because I think yeah. um, you, you've been, you're one of the few filmmakers I know that's been able to navigate from climate change over to data surveillance. I mean, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's like all the same problem. Yeah. <laughs> Human beings. Well, I would, uh, yeah. um, for those who are interested, this is a, um, a tome of a book, but The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff was a massive, massive um, mind bending uh, text for me to go through and process in the making of this film. Um, she draws a very, very powerful analogy between industrial capitalism and surveillance capitalism. And I think this, uh, I think this gets to your question, Paul, and, and ties in for me this transition that I saw. Um, she argues that industrial capitalism figured out ways to turn nature into a raw resource for extraction and the fossil fuel industry being one of the most prominent ways which we see that being enacted. We found something in the ground, we're able to mine it and tap into it, turn that into profit. Um, uh, Surveillance capitalism, born out of Google and then transferred over to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and other places and now has become the dominant business model of social media and search. Surveillance capitalism has figured out a way to turn human nature into a raw resource for extraction. Um, They're not selling our data. They are not selling, like we're not paying for the product. They are selling the ability to manipulate us, the public. They are selling the ability to get um, whatever anybody wants to in front of our eyes. And the offering that they're making is that we have so hyper-targeted, we know everybody, we know their interests, we know who's interested in what, what they're selling is greater probability of success for a sale, like as opposed to a billboard that, you know, a million people might drive by and very few will lead to a conversion of purchasing a product. The thing that Facebook and Twitter and Google are selling is, no, we know exactly what makes Paul Miller tick. And we know exactly how we're going to get to, uh, you know, put something in front of Paul that is going to yield uh, a, you know, a, a greater predictability of engagement. That in some ways is what they're selling. Now, that can seem pretty innocent if you're talking about a pair of sneakers or a cool hat or scarf. It's very different than when we're talking about political ideology. Um, but the, the problem isn't even just a matter of the selling. It's not even the, the rectangle of the ad that is the problem. It's the fact that the process of doing the data collection and reverse engineering what makes an individual tick, that in and of itself, the ability to harness the data to know how to sell better to you is in fact a polarizing process where we now learn 
through those mechanisms um, what any individual is, is interested in. This is where uh, one of our subjects, um, Roger McNamee, he references, you know, we're all living in our own Truman Show. There are 2.7 billion Truman Shows operating around the world. And anybody who's accessing Facebook or Twitter or fill in the blank social media platform is being reflected like you're getting your own funhouse mirror, your own customized, personalized funhouse mirror of the world um, based on whatever's going to work best on you. So the entire incentive structure for social media is warped. Like in my mind, the incentive structure around this business model is as unethical and is out of sync with humanity as fossil fuels and, and the problem of climate change. And it, like along those same lines, it's massively complicated for us to fix and flip and reverse and, and solve our way out of it. So that's where film and other sort of storytelling narratives can really give us a sense of some of some better narrative tools to, to help get people a sense yeah. of, I mean, right now it's like the frog in the boiling pot, you know, it's like, um, exactly. it doesn't jump out because the water just increases ex incrementally. And yep. what's going on, I think, and what is so powerful about your film is that you guys focus on this as an addiction. That's one thing I really, there's an addiction expert from um, who's part of your storytelling. And there's an evolutionary need for humans to exchange information. Right. Um, and I, th I found it to be one of the really sharp, you know, compelling. There was a great film a couple of years ago called The Corporation. Do you remember this one? Yes. Uh, it was 2003. Yeah, yeah. What's that guy? Yeah, right. um, the director. Yeah, great. But they did this whole thing about corporations as a psychopath. And they actually had right. a psychoanalysis of corporate behavior. So yes. you guys have updated that with this notion of addictive behavioral evolution. <laughs> right, right. So let's unpack some of that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I've been thinking through this analogy. Um, along evolutionary terms. So let me let me share this analogy, then tie it back into your question and where I think you're going. But um, it just sort of follows the the uh, the Truman Show analogy. But the way I think of it, each and every one of us is on our own Galapagos Island, right? We're all on our individual islands, our own islands of thought that are being self-reflected back to us. And the more you engage with an algorithm, the more it has figured you out and the more you use it, the more addicted you are, the faster that evolutionary process happens in some ways. And yet you're on your own little isolated island of thought and all of us are on our Galapagos drifting farther and farther away from each other in the ocean to the point where just like with evolution and speciation, when, uh, when a species gets separated and over time they continue to evolve, they hit a point where they're no longer sexually compatible with each other. And now you have two separate species. I think that same thing is happening with our ideas, that we're at a place now where ideas are evolving faster and faster the more you engage, but they're bifurcating on these platforms, which is making polarization inherent, uh, inherent result of the system, making it harder and harder. If you think about somebody that you disagree with politics on and you think, okay, that was the way the conversation went a decade ago, and what does the conversation look like now? People are coming to the table with such different facts, such a completely different starting point that it's harder and harder to have conversations with people that you might disagree with. And, and this is, in many ways, this is what we were realizing with climate change. When we were doing our impact work with Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, we were meeting people all around the country that just completely disagreed with the evidence and the facts that we learned about from science. And it, to, to find a place of common ground, the number of steps you have to take backwards just to find some common ground was really, really challenging. Um, so going back to what you're you're talking about there, Paul, and setting up around um, this addiction frame, um, the these platforms are a b testing constantly what works on each and every one of us, right? That that really is the mantra that drives engagement. There's an algorithm that's testing all the content in the world against you, and if you have two, let's let's say there are two different feeds. One is the Walter Cronkite calm, rational extremely um, neutral, no opinions embedded in any of its straight news. And then you have a more radical version of that on any spectrum, right? It doesn't matter pointing to the left, pointing to the right, opinions, um, uh, clickbait headlines, which one of those two options is going to be more engaging? Like very clearly there's one that's going to work better for, for an engagement model. And that's what we're seeing with each and every individual feed that it's pushing down this path of greater engagement and moving away from a shared truth. Um, 
uh, that this is one of the things I'm most worried about is, is the polarization function, like how, how polarization is coming out as a result of the way these platforms are programmed based on the incentive model. Um, that, I mean, there's a whole that, range of uh, consequences. Yeah. yeah. Go and for Paul. Jeff, there's so many bits and pieces I want to I want to unpack of what you were just saying, which is, I like this note, the term you just used, the polarization model, I and mean, that sounds like the next Radiohead. But um, you know, so <laughs> right now when we think about like the notion that these these uh, platforms, pretty much every platform uh, that you can possibly imagine is doing that kind of sort of data monetization and the optimization of how people engage with the the algorithms that drive those platforms. So. It's, it's the mechanism that's probably gonna be, it's already created a huge crisis. To me right now, like Trump is just like Russian malware at this point, you know, it's just kind of, <laughs> um, you know, the, the president as malware. And um, that, that has directly led from, you know, he actually was out of reality TV. Most of the people in his administration are coming out of like really bad film producers like Steve Bannon produced documentaries. Right. Steve Mnuchin, who's secretary of the treasury produced Wonder Woman, I don't know if you, <laughs> which is totally wild, mm. um, you know, so they have a kind of a film sensibility going. And that's why like recently, like he's, he's on dexamethadone, which is this crazy steroid and decided like radically to just stage a film shoot on the White House lawn with this helicopter landing and all this crazy while he's tweeting. I mean, so all this stuff is, I, again, it could, the paradox of democracy mixed with authoritarian urges, you know, it's distilled right down into this moment. And the film reflects that. Um, what about the like previous eras? Like, for example, Jeff, I'd love because you have more data on you now than, say, for example, the Stasi would have had in East Germany, um, you know, or any communist regime. And the American sensibilities that, oh, we're free culture. And if you compare us to China, the Chinese are under surveillance. The Americans don't realize that we're under actually far more. Um, and I'd love to maybe get your compare because that was the only thing I would have loved to hear more of your take on what's yeah. going on between, between China and the U.S. Just, to, just yeah, in an there. odd way, like China is just um, explicit about their surveillance of their people. In the United States, we have corporate surveillance of the people in a hidden and opaque way that is happening with just as much frequency, just not used by the same actors. Um, and uh, there's some posts in the chat around uh, neo-colonialism, and this is uh, I'm totally plus one on that. It's this is digital <laughs> colonialism just in in our lives. Um, the things I was going to add. So uh, this goes a little bit beyond the scope of what we have in the film, but goes to Shoshana Zuboff's scope around surveillance capitalism. Um, in the film, we were really trying to focus more on the attention economy um, aspects of it. So the social media companies and the search companies uh, that really are motivated around attention. But there is this birth of this entire surveillance capitalism frame that is trying to use data for financial profits in lots of different arenas that, that go beyond um, our attention. All right. So going back to what you're asking, Paul, like the way data can be used for financial gains uh, that is misaligned with the public good. Um, I, I think I have, okay, these are the books I've been referencing lately. Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction, which I just love that title, Weapons of Math <laughs> Destruction, and then um, Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression. Um, so I would highly recommend all of those. But um, uh, some of the stuff that Kathy talks about, okay, there are algorithms that inform um, police uh, or, or judge sentencing. So if a judge needs to like give a sentence to somebody in how many years, algorithms are offering recommendations based on historical data of which type of prisoners get which amount of time. So if the data that's going into that system is based on a racist history of policing in a community, then the recommendation that's going to come out of that algorithm is also going to have um, the same racist uh, sentiments that are embodied in the in the source code. Um, we're seeing that with uh, hiring algorithms. We're seeing it with credit card algorithms. So different people in society are being offered different things based on data that's being pulled without real clarity and insight around what what data is there. If each and every one of us went to, this is, I actually haven't tested this, but this is uh, according to Kathy. If all of us went to a credit card website 
and we're looking for credit card recommendations, <clears throat> we would get different credit cards recommended to us based on what the system knows about us and our credit history and our and our financial history. Um, so it's not an even playing field. It's kind of pre-filtering and pre-sourcing that. Um, along the same lines, uh, hiring algorithms. So a hiring algorithm, uh, there was a, a famous case study that came out around an algorithm for a company that recommended that it hire men named Jared who played lacrosse because disproportionately <laughs> at that company, men who name who were named Jared who played the cross did well at that particular company and so that's what the algorithm was then recommending so the, the this is all a reflection of countless different areas in which data is being collected on our lives on a regular basis like we just emit data this used to be considered like our digital footprint and had no value and then google and others figured out ways to collect all of that and build these models of us um I've heard different numbers. I've heard 29,000. I've heard higher the number of data points that Facebook has on us, right? And try to think about writing 29,000 facts about yourself. I could, it would be difficult in my mind to even build a list like that of things that are about my personality, but, but they are collecting all of this information all the time as we <laughs> mit, um data uh, footprints in our daily lives. Even if you don't click on a link. If you go to a website that has a Facebook like button on it, Facebook is tracking the fact that you've been to that website, regardless of whether or not you click on that link. So that's another part of a, a digital trail that you're leaving behind where we know what, you, what you've what you engaged with. Um, and there's another, uh, there's some research that came out, like if you like 300 things on Facebook, with 300 likes, Facebook can predict your patterns and your interests better than your significant other. Like that's a level of, th there's this phrase that um, uh, Yuval Harari uses that the algorithms will know you better than you know yourself. And that we're entering into this realm now where this amount, the amount of data that has been collected about us, the use of these models to, and, and this is the analogy we, we bring about in the social dilemma is this digital avatar being reverse engineered of, of Ben's character. And the more you engage, the better and better it is at understanding you and predicting you and reverse engineering you. And the, the big question is, okay, if we have the ability to create a model like this of each and every one of us, what is that model being used for, right? Right now, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and Google are using that digital model of us to better monetize us. Right. That, that is the mission and the objective of, the, of the, these companies in its current form. But it, it doesn't need to be that way, right? Like I want a digital model of myself that my doctor has access to so that my doctor can best predict the medical risks that I'm, I'm subject to and can help, you know, give me a life plan around optimizing health. I don't want that model to be in my insurance company's hands you know, pricing my insurance structure based on what, you know, what diseases might come down the line and what those risks are. It, it really comes down to like these, these digital tools. Like I, I, I am a pro technologist. Like I love technology. I'm very, very, a, a decade ago, I was extremely positive about the opportunities and um, potential of, of great technology. Now I think I've become so skeptical just because Who's controlling the tech for what purpose? And it is just an extension of capitalism at this point. It's this neoliberal capitalist frame that has just figured out ways to turn everything and anything into money. And now we, the humans, are the raw resource being exploited by these systems. And it, it just disgusts me to my core. And I, it's one of these things where like, we need such a massive shift in how society functions and operates and, and how these companies are regulated. Um, to get back in sync with what human what's what's serving humanity's interests and needs. 
Um, right. Paul, and you're so going to have to reel me in because yeah. I'm just going to you, you wind me up and just going to go. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it. It's great. I, I feel like you, you're doing like a hip hop freestyle there. Um, so, OK, let's there's one or two things. I just want to kind of pivot just for a moment. Please. One, please. the European Union's relationship to data and yes. GDPR and the data, general yes, data yes. protection regulation versus yeah. the U.S. versus China. Those are going to be yeah. probably the three major geographic. Right. A lot of people are now saying that we're moving into an era where different regional um, and or national yeah. nation states are regulating the Internet in very different ways. Right. And that was one thing that I felt right. like your film had a really yeah. nice sort of um, pivot towards. But at the end, you can only handle so much in one film. You can all, Is yeah. There, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you have any sensibilities for like, let's put it this way. An American model, like for example, recently the controversy around TikTok, uh, Trump, the Trump administration mm -hmm. was trying to get China to, to have their servers based in the U.S. Um, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of data surveillance flying around. We're not quite sure, but TikTok, um, it's been in limbo. But it's one of the most wildly popular uh, platforms. Did you, that, uh, that was probably at the edge of the the discussion of your film, but. We all know capitalism is in a crisis, and so is democracy. Um, and right. wealth inequality is moving forward at, at like a hyper insane rate. Um, this might be asking you to just do a crystal ball thing, but where do you see us before? I mean, we're obviously just a little bit out near this election. Both administrations are going to have a very different approach. Do you have any thoughts on that? If there's a Biden yeah. versus, yeah, like, sorry, just, that's a yeah. little bit. No, I, yeah. so Go many. Ahead. I've got like half a dozen things I want to talk about based on, on, on your prompt there. Um, the I think the U.S. government has demonstrated its um, lack of knowledge and ability to rein this in. I, I think it really is just we need to educate our politicians as fast as possible about like how these technologies are actually operating. The notion of um, antitrust, which is like the leading conversation right now, is viable and worth pursuing, yet just a drop in the bucket and doesn't actually address the fundamental business model challenges. Um, so waiting for the US to take regulatory action is gonna take a long time, I think. Um, Europe has been ahead of the curve with GDPR and, and other um, thoughts on the table. And I think that is something where my, uh, a place of hope and optimism is that Europe might get their act together and put regulations in place um, sooner than the US does and that the corporations, these companies won't want to miss out on the European market. And so they'll, they'll sort of be forced to to mold to that um, as a reminder um, it's so funny because for a long time uh, climate were was the arena that our team was working on and we always referenced um, the fossil fuel industry as the richest history in the industry uh, the richest the richest industry in the history of money and now the tech industry has become the richest industry in the history of money and to the point where Google has Google spends more on lobbying the US government than any other entity. They are the number one spender of lobbying efforts. Um, so how do we change legislation in a meaningful way where you need to get to the representatives and get them to understand what's going on um, and to sort of avoid the pressures of uh, the Google, Google lobbying efforts? Um, going to your, your point about TikTok and sort of the geopolitical threat posed there, um, the... Uh, I actually do agree with the the risk of an of a foreign company coming into the U.S. and collecting U.S. data where we don't know where that's going to go. I think there are huge, huge geopolitical concerns here. But separate from the TikTok argument, just looking at the Facebook, Instagram, Twitter structure, you know, if a foreign country were to fly a plane or a nuclear warhead into American airspace our American defense systems would like immediately act up, shut it down, be on it like, like nothing else. Yet we have a, a system in place right now where foreign countries can launch information bombs into our American soil, where American companies have made American products that foreign nationalists, foreign nations can use for little to no money to launch information warfare on our soil with almost no traceability as well. And the, the, the risk posed by this technology from a geopolitical perspective is mind boggling. Um, we're seeing uh, news over the last month or so around how Russia has used 
um, they've changed their tactics from 2016 and now they're just hiring Americans and paying Americans to write particularly leading stories and just infiltrating that into the information ecosystem with very little trace back to the, the origin and the source of the manipulation. Um, we've also seen there's a BuzzFeed, a BuzzFeed piece with Sophia Zhang, uh, an insider at Facebook who has revealed um, just how much political manipulation she was seeing within the company. Um, her direct quote was she recognizes that she, she now has blood on her hands from the political manipulations that she has seen that Facebook hasn't either taken action on or act, responded too slowly on. So we, th these, are, these are tools of um, mass deception that we are just allowing to exist where there's no filter on what's coming in and the algorithms will pour lighter fluid on everything <clears throat> and anything and only take down, you know, if something seems really, really bad, then, then the content moderators come in and try to squash a particular thing. But in most cases, like it's already gone viral. Lies lie spread six times faster than truth on these platforms. And so it's just an infinite game of whack-a-mole just trying to catch up. There's no way to keep up, right? The, right. The, I, yeah, go for it, Paul. Okay, so I, I, sorry to keep in your, I just want to unpack some of these issues because- No, please, because I'm just yeah, going to keep rambling. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, geo, the geopolitics of which makes us all so intriguing right now is like, people are weaponizing information and we're in an era where what initially it started as an open source open community uh, don't forget the web comes out of cern and the internet itself comes out of um ucla and darpa net and so on in fact the, the internet turned turned 50 last year the last year there's a big event at ucla uh celebrating the 50th anniversary of the internet and so nation state politics as applied to digital media are going to become the norm and they already i mean the russians what was fascinating with the 2016 election, don't forget, of course, Cambridge Analytica did the sort of yeah. psycho, psychometrics, um, was how much, how eerily predictable human beings are. I mean, there's a whole Pavlovian process at work. So in your film, what, what I thought was an elegant continuity, because with your previous films, you have this incredibly uh, beautiful cinematic expose of the melting of the ice sheets. Now, if you guys haven't seen Chasing Ice, it's a brilliant film about photography, environmental issues and sort of time lapse of how you can easily see these sort of t temporal processes that the human doesn't necessarily engage. And so I've always viewed Jeff as a, as a sort of a, a temporalist, somebody who's really into mm -hmm. figuring out how time can be um, documented in a very clever way to show you these huge processes happening. But cool. so he's yeah. applied that same logic to this current topic. Um, so Jeff, let's pivot for a second. I mean, you, you guys had Jaron Lanier, you had Georgiana Zuboff, um, Tristan Harris, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about his foundation for um, the humane technology because yeah. there, like, there are solutions out there and maybe you could use that as a talk about solutions-based issues. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Tristan <clears throat> thinks about uh, his organization is called the Center for Humane Technology. Um, their intention and objective is to kind of bring humanity back into our tech. Um, one, of the, one of the touch points there is uh, one of Tristan's co-founders is Aza Raskin and Aza's father, Jeff Raskin, was on, founded the Macintosh team at Apple. And uh, I, I bring up this lineage in that uh, it actually was a huge place of thinking and inspiration for Tristan and Aza and their team. Jeff Raskin coined the phrase cognetics. Actually, I don't think he coined the phrase. He was a, a, a proponent of it, but I don't know if he was the origin there. But the the notion of cognetics is the ergonomics of the mind like we all sit in chairs that look pretty similar because we've figured out ergonomics around the human body and we've designed our physical infrastructure to support uh, and work with the size and scale of the human body yet we aren't applying our technology around how the human mind works and how human society works and how our psychology and sociology works and uh, one, one tangible example here along these lines is the concept of the Dunbar number, where a researcher um, identified that humans fit tribes of about 150 people. We can maintain close relationships of 150 people, but once you start breaking beyond that, it, it starts to unravel. Um, this has been taken seriously by some corporations that uh, as they're building a team, they literally put 150 people into a building together, and when they have 
when the team continues to grow, they put them in a separate building and start another 150 person group and et cetera, because those are the scales of relationships that we can maintain. Like that simple concept has gone out the door with, oh, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook or whatever the number is, right? The Facebook in some ways has usurped this word friend and morphed it into this thing where these aren't real relationships. Um, the friends you may know algorithm, um, F, uh, YMK, that's what they call it internally, FYMK, is the algorithm that as any of you Facebook users have all seen, oh, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Oh, you and Paul have 56 mutual friends and oh, you and this person, like, and that is a growth algorithm and it's a technique designed to grow the size of your network in large part, not, not to give you better a fulfillment in life or to help you aspire to your personal aspirations. It's really just an algorithm designed to grow the size of the network. Um, and the more friends you have and the more followers you have, the more potential engagements there are for advertisements with any particular post. Um, I remember 10 years ago where, oh, you and Paul have six mutual friends and we could talk about each and every one of those friends and, oh, how do you know that person? And how do you know that person? And, no, that's such a dear friend to me that I met through so-and-so. And now if I look at that, it's like, oh, you have 150 mutual friends and I don't know 140 of them. Right. I, I, I bring this up as an example because like, it's clear that these these platforms aren't being designed around the human connections that are that are inherent, the human connections that we were promised um, that not that we were promised, but that they were claiming um, were part of the original appeal of these platforms. One of our subjects um, says these aren't these platforms are not connection. They are kind of connectivity. When you are connecting with a human, you're looking face to face, I can see the nods, I can see the mirror neurons in the back of my brain are lighting up. I can read the 42 muscles on your face that are giving human communication. We get more information through nonverbal communication that we're getting through text format, right? And so that's what real connection is. FaceTime, Zoom, these are technologies that, that, that aim towards those levels of human connection. Um, but you're not getting that through 280 characters. Like the context is lost. The nuance is lost. If I post something as a joke on Twitter, somebody doesn't read the sarcasm or the intention and then replicates that and posts a critique and then that goes down a downward spiral. And it's so far removed from the original source material and the intention there. Um, that's what's happening at scale. Um, in many ways, I look at Twitter as a decontextualizing machine that is... Um, losing the nuance and the gray zones in life. It's losing the ability for people to have, to come together and have deep conversations around challenging subjects. And um, it really is just going towards hyperpolarization and what's going to get the best response and the most retweets in the shortest form. Right. So let's unpack that. Actually, from the viewpoint of the, 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 the 700 pound gorilla in the room, which is, of course, Facebook. Now, amusingly enough, Jeff, your film got under their skin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, they were pissed and they posted a, a rebuke to your film. Yes. I'll just post it. Um, sure. It, absolutely. Of course, falls very flat. I'm going to say Facebook was pissed. All right. <laughs> so they, I guess their leadership team saw um, your film and then issued a multi point rebuke for each point right. in the film. Um, do you want to do you want to unpack that a little bit? Just as a well, one of I mean, uh, I, I thought this, it might be something. Yeah, you know. yeah. This is in many ways. I just consider this our highest success. Is that uh, we got under their skin and and um, and look, we're not <laughs> we're we're critiquing this entire business model and the entire industry, right? We're um, we're not critiquing solely Facebook. The principles and practices at Facebook are the same at Google and in Twitter and what have you. Um, but one of the things that they that they're trying to claim, which the internet has responded um, with the same emotions that I feel, they're, they're trying to say that we're not the product. And it, it it's just so misaligned with the realities of how their system works that it, it just boggles my mind that they're trying to lean into that argument. If everybody stopped using Facebook and Instagram, there would be nothing to sell to advertisers. Like advertisers <laughs> would not use the system because there would be nothing of value to them if people stopped using it. I don't know how to think of that as anything other than we are the product. 
Um, and, and so, <laughs> that could be a, t a fun band uh, band name as well. Right. Yeah. Um, um, we actually were thinking about titling the film something like that too, like "We the Product." Like we <laughs> instead of "We the People," like "We the Product" are wanting to push back. Um, I just didn't like that frame because I don't want us to lean into like we have to stop being the product, not not doubling down on that. Yeah. Okay. So Facebook, Google, Twitter. I mean, most of them were a lot of the major CEOs were called to you know kind of testify recently about, of course, monopolies and um, their control of much of the infrastructure for social media processes. Um, that just happened a couple of days ago. The main CEOs were all um, asked to testify. Um, but your film really triggers, I think, a great conversation that's really important right now, which is how do the arts and, of course, this notion of data kind of, um, for lack of a better word, sort of the data economy overlap? Because, I mean, this is an art-oriented magazine. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about, um, I mean, you're, you're, you began the discussion where you were saying we're, we're each in our own Truman Show. I actually could see that as some crazy Cindy Sherman installation or something where hmm. everyone um, is assigned a, um, an algorithmic face when they go into her installation I, yes. or photograph or something. Do uh, you have any take on art around oh this? Oh my goodness. Any, any uh, there's so that? many. I've really wanted to do some sort of VR piece where you log in with your social media account. And while you're in the VR piece, it's customizing the entire VR experience specifically for you. And um, I, I think there are really, really powerful ways that could be done. I haven't figured out the like this the special sauce there but absolutely i feel like art is one of the most powerful ways that that we can sort of wake people up from the trance that we're in um and to reflect back you know as as we attempt to do in the social dilemma to reflect back to people a very different way to look at the story that we've been sold by these companies um uh you know the phrase the phrase uh if you're not paying for the product you are the product that phrase has been so heavily used in Silicon Valley for a f several years now to the point where when we were making the film, I almost didn't include it in the movie because the people in the tech industry were like, yeah, 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 we've heard that a gazillion times. <laughs> and then the realization that whenever I shared that phrase with my family, you know, back home or just friends who aren't following tech in a close basis, um, it hit hard. It, it hit really, really hard for the average person. And there was the realization of, okay, my, my job and role as an artist is to convey these ideas to the public, to make them emotional, to make them tangible, to make them accessible. And in many ways, this, I, I feel this pattern for Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral and The Social Dilemma, where a lot of our thinking for myself and our team is, okay, let's go and talk to the experts and the scientists and the people who are studying it and the people who are making it. And how do we best first understand it well enough so I can explain it to others. That actually is for me, that's like the first part of my process and, and my, my um, experience is that I need to be able to explain it to my sister and her husband and my family about like, this is why you should care. This is what, what's going on. And I use the process of talking with friends to, to figure out if I know it well enough that I can explain it verbally. Um, you know, this was a huge part of corals with Chase and Coral. Like, can I explain what a coral is to get somebody to be like, wow, this is really, really beautiful. And look at the magic of this, this ecosystem. Um, so understanding it well, so that I can then re-explain it and reconvey it to the public in a way that it both makes sense and is engaging and, um, and is hopefully transformative. So I feel like art has such a huge opportunity. Like we need to be doing more of this. Um, art and, and political commentary around our surveillance, our corporate surveillance state mm -hmm. um, is really, really needed right now. Um, VR experiences, um, uh, all, just let's run the whole gamut on what can be made. Okay. Installations so I think I have actually... a huge opportunity. And I actually, because I've seen your other films, I mean, there's, you have a really great cinematic eye. I mean, I remember there's oh, one thanks. scene in Chasing Coral where you set up cameras underwater, you actually learn to scuba dive. Yeah. Um, and so you have an applied philosophy of, just, of both action and the film itself as a learning process, which I think was really yes. compelling. Um, oh, yeah. So let's, um, let's look to That's the, the near self, future. The selfish part yeah. for me there is like, making documentary films is just my like excuse to be a master's student in whatever subject matter I'm going to dive into for the next couple of years. So it's, uh, I, I just love that part of the process of, of doc filmmaking. Sorry for cutting you off okay. there, Paul. 
Yeah. Oh, no, 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 it's all good. Um, I'm actually very intrigued because there's other filmmakers like Werner Herzog, who's a fan, of, I'm a huge fan of his documentaries. You've taken a more of a, I, I wanted to see, talk about your craft a little bit, just for a little bit to see what informs your sense of how you put a scene together. Um, because every documentary right now, we're in a weird world where documentaries are, there's an overload, one could argue. Um, there can never be enough, but I do think that stylistically speaking, Werner yeah. Herzog, I love the way he narrates his films and gives you a sense right. of how he's like, these are the gay penguin in Antarctica. I mean, you yeah. know, there's this funny, funny scene in, um, you know, so there, he, his voice has this kind of hilarious um, right. kind of commentary, but you don't do that. You don't, you, you have the character speak. Yeah. I just, can you unpack your philosophy of your style of film yeah. as well? Just because I think people would be into that as well. Yeah. Um, I think that the style, so for me, this probably would not be how Werner answers the question. For me, the style of the film is informed by the story that you're trying to tell and the subjects um, whose voices you're trying to, to spotlight. Um, and the approach to the filmmaking for me is informed by the story. So in the case of The Social Dilemma, we had access to these tech insiders and the people who worked at these companies. And that for me was the, the thing that I thought would, would ground the film more than anything else. Like I wanted the trailer, I could see the trailer. I wanted people to say, I worked at Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Like that was an essential part because um, for me at least, that's those are the brands that I know of, right? Those are the companies that I interact with on a daily basis, I'm using them. And I wasn't aware of how they were manipulating me. So in this particular case, we, we leaned into that. At the same time, um, we had this idea for a narrative component to bring to life what we were learning. Like similar to Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral was the revealing the invisible. Like what's, what's hiding on the other side of this you know, little rectangular screen in my pocket? Um, Inside Out was an inspiration for that. Um, actually, the big short was an early inspiration around like, how could we do the documentary version of the big short um, and have scenes that could bring the story to life. And then Inside Out was like, okay, this is the way we can do it. We can anthropomorphize the emotions and we can reveal the invisible through this storyline. And, um, uh, but, but there was a big conversation that our team was having. There were people on our team that were like, well, let's just do the full narrative movie. Let's, why do we need the interviews? Let's just do a narrative that brings this whole thing to life. And other people were like, we don't need the narrative. Like the documentary is like the juicy part. Like this is the insider expose. Um, and, and, and for me, there was something more powerful that could come from the combination of the two than from either of them separately. Because I wanted the narrative to be based in truth. I wanted it to, to be labeled and called a documentary such that you know this is nonfiction. It's not the documentary word that was important, it's the nonfiction word that was important, um, which we can open up a whole conversation around that too, because there's no, like you can have nonfiction best-selling books that you know hit the top of the charts and many nonfiction books do that. Nonfiction filmmaking doesn't really have that same nuance. You know, we have so many different categories of comedy, horror, drama, adventure, rom-com for fiction films. And then all the nonfiction movies get lumped into this one word of documentary and they all get blended together. And there's, we don't have the nuance and the breakdown and, and it has been historically more challenging for nonfiction films to rise to those top levels. Um, but I wanted the film to really be recognized as nonfiction, yet at the same time, accessible, entertaining, and mind-blowing in a way that could hopefully help audiences see the thing that they interact with every day in a slightly different way. Like my hope is that a teenager is gonna like finish watching the movie, they're gonna go, I've heard this so many times, like people immediately wanna go and post on social media about the film and then are immediately questioning like, well, wait a second, what am I doing? And <laughs> that ability to question that moment Right. I want you to picture Vinny Kartheiser on the other side of the screen. Like, wait a second, why is this notification popping up right now? Like, what what is incentivizing the system that I'm engaging with? Um, so that I don't know if that gets to your question, Paul. Like, that's how the style of this particular film came about. Um, I think all artists are drawn to different different ways and different means. Um, and for me, I, I try to be as flexible and adaptable to the story as possible. And what how is the story going to be best revealed 
Um, what are the ways that we can bring the story to life that will resonate with the audience? And, and also just to add, I do tend to, tend to really think about who is the audience that you have in mind when making a film. An audience okay. for me is a really, really <clears throat> important starting point. I, I try to narrow that in. Um, with, with Chasing Coral, there was literally a friend's, uh, one friend's parents who were the, per the people that I kept having in mind around, they are climate deniers that I was able to, to like move on climate change over the course of a long dinner. And they're not bad people. They're not malintended people. They, they just were presented with different facts and information. And that's the person who I want to be able to connect with. Um, and I, I do think that art can be a Trojan horse in many cases where it could be mm -hmm. inviting people in through the beauty and the aesthetic and the process or what have you and then deliver the message um, through through the art. Okay, and so considering you're a documentary filmmaker talking to an art world audience, I always think it's really good to kind of get a little sense of where your uh, first inspirations came. Are you, I remember you, you were at Stanford. Did you study film? Did you, were, was it something that you'd always wanted to be in? Or because you've come from a more yeah. of a philosophical background. You want to yeah. give people a little bit of your background? Like, uh, totally, you totally. Um, and things like that? Uh, born and <clears throat> raised in New York on Staten Island. I went to uh, Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan um, and I studied journalism there. Uh, it, it was an amazing opportunity as a high school student. We had New York Times editors come in every week, every Thursday, two New York Times editors came in and taught our journalism class. Um, and it was just such a transformational experience. Um, my senior year, in high school was 9-11 and our high school was four blocks away from the World Trade Center. And that was the, the biggest sort of life altering event for me. Uh, jumping in as, as editor in chief of our newspaper at the time, it was like, oh shit, we gotta go to work. And our whole team really rose to the occasion and just wore our hats as journalists trying to cover the story, like this massive global story happening four blocks away from our building. Um, so that, that was a massively transformational experience for me. Uh, when I went to Stanford, I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. And I remember I made this really geeky spreadsheet, but I, I like took, <laughs> I went through the entire course bulletin and I circled all the classes that sounded interesting. And I, I was in a four class dorm. So I had uh, juniors and seniors and upperclassmen in the dorm that I was in. And I was getting advice from all of them about what are the best classes that you took? And people were recommending classes that I never ever would have considered taking. So all across the board, like I took a class um, uh, on negotiation, like the class was literally called negotiation. And that was a massively transformational class. Um, I took classes uh, in lots of different departments, design thinking, art, philosophy classes, um, uh, ms &E classes, which was the closest thing uh, to like the tech route. Um, and so I, I was getting all these recommendations from friends and built the spreadsheet of these are the, the classes that my friends say are the best classes at Stanford. And I optimized my entire major to take as many of those classes as possible and reverse engineered into an anthropology major, um, which I also had interest in, but it's the major that allowed me to optimize for the, the classes that seemed most interesting from everybody else. So I really feel like I, I tried to maximize that experience in learning everything that I could in different areas. Um, I was taking classes in film um, that my friend Jack Conti, so my, one of my closest friends out of college, um, Jack Conti is a filmmaker and musician. Um, he has gone on to found Patreon. Um, so if you're familiar with Patreon as a platform that was founded by Jack, um, Jack was the one who twisted my arm uh, to make me move from photography to filmmaking. And he was the one who convinced me to take a, a student run film workshop my junior year at Stanford. And that completely changed my course. Um, so I, I was doing that on the film side. And then at the same time, I was working with friends to build websites for photographers. Um, so James Baylog and other photographers that I had known, like we were building these early flash based websites just to give a better visual portfolio for these um, photographers that, that I had known. And um, yes, and Jack and Natalie Pomplamus. Um, so uh, I was going down this path of working on tech startups with these friends. And we were trying at one point after graduating, um, some friends and I were trying to build a, a new news media tech platform and going down the route of startups. And then 
the iPhone came out and many of those friends went on to build companies that were uh, doing iOS apps. Um, and so literally my, my college experience was like this film and art and storytelling community and then this tech community. And it completely came back full circle in 2017 where it was like, when I started to realize what my friends at Stanford were saying about the tech, it was, it, it was a complete coming back. Like that, that is what gave birth to this movie. This movie would not have existed without those connections and those influences and those stories and those ideas um, coming from these friends. Um, one last thing to add, while at Stanford, I was an Apple campus rep. It was like the coolest, I thought it was a really <laughs> cool job, like literally selling <laughs> Apple computers at Stanford. Like I was a massive Apple evangelist, just like going out and, and you know, pimping Apple computers to everybody and just convincing everybody why this was the best platform to use and teaching people how to use Apple software in the, you know, the early and mid 2000s. Um, and it was uh, three of us had that job, um, Tristan Harris, uh, Jeff Seibert, and myself, the three of us all were Apple campus reps. Um, and we each sort of uh, loved the powerful opportunity of the technology. There's another person who was an Apple campus rep that kind of came after us, who's now an executive at a big social media company. And it's like these, the four of us in many ways are so connected and linked through these experiences and we've gone on to continue to work on technology in in different ways and to reflect on it um so it's just i, I look at um one of malcolm gladwell's books uh which was it um i forget if it was if it was tipping point uh i forget which book it was but he he references how Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and there was an era of people who came out at the right time when the technology was ripe, that had the right experiences, that were able to like sort of make this huge leap in what that technology era created. And I feel like that same thing happened in the mid 2000s out of Stanford, where the iPhone was coming out and iOS was, was being introduced and the app stores were being introduced, and there was a new birth of technological opportunities when people had the right skill sets and the right, right mindsets. And I, I feel like Stanford was in many ways that breeding ground of this new era of technology. I love hearing you, the fact um, that you got into uh, the whole East Coast, West Coast. I live a couple blocks over from yeah. Stuyvesant in Tribeca. I'm on Duane. Oh, and, yeah. You're great. It's, it's a tiny little street. Yeah. But, um, and then you've been at Stanford and lecturing yeah, an artist so. at Stanford. <laughs> it's it's these blends. And now Boulder, Colorado, which is my current home, I feel like it's the third coast um, yeah. in between the two and uh, get the best of both worlds and yet getting nature in my backyard. And by the way, Palantir is moving their headquarters to Denver. Oh so my you goodness. Have to do a, you have Let's to do a lecture there one them. of these days. <laughs> But um, all right, I know it's one o'clock. Um, Nick and other Brooklyn folks, do you guys want to, um, Jeff? If you're open to um, open things up to questions, yeah, or absolutely. I can keep. I can keep going for a bit. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, Nick I, and crew, you guys want to jump in for a second? For sure. I I want to thank you both, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for such a wonderfully engaged chat today. Thank you, everyone, for sending all of your questions. We have a bunch. I hope we can get to as many as we can. Um, first, I'm going to pass the mic over to Steve. Steve, you should get a prompt now to activate your mic. Okay, I'm here, thank you. And um, it's funny, years ago I worked at 26 Federal Plaza, which is right by Duane and Reed Streets. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> out of Manhattan for well, but now yeah. I'm in Brooklyn. My question has to do with, this whole subject, the attention economy. Um, my second thinking uh, uh, mentor, Dr. Russell Acoff from Wharton, taught me that there are things we don't measure because we're mm -hmm. not actually paying attention to everything. You know, yeah. the universe exists, but for example, journalism doesn't cover everything. Journalism covers yeah. things. It, it, Thinks it can make money from it, right, right. If it bleeds, it leads drama, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. What I stumbled on twenty plus years ago was something called the corporate social responsibility movement. Yep. The UN has this project called the UN Global Compact, 
since the uh, year 2000, launched by Kofi Annan. These are the business leaders who want to change the value system underlying capitalism. They actually yeah. know profit should not be the first priority. But you know, if you do a Google search on the New York Times, they have never written a story about the UN Global Compact. And hmm. that is an issue I don't know. Well, I, I have some thoughts on what to do about it, but I'd like you two to talk about in an attention economy, how do we get those who, who guide the attention to, to cover what matters, like corporate social responsibility, like solutions that exist that for some reason, I mean, I once chatted with Katie Couric briefly 10 years ago, and she couldn't, it was like corporate social responsibility, what? You know, it's like I was a man from Mars. So how do we get the attention economy to focus on what it, what, yeah. what thank you. Yeah, you're, you're asking a good question and I, I would, um, okay, so lots of thoughts on this. Um, thank you. <laughs> we, we, we manage what we measure, right? That's a phrase that's, that's often used. We manage what we measure. And I think one of the big problems that we're dealing with with social media and media in general is that we're measuring the wrong thing. We're measuring what's easy to measure. And we're measuring what we're measuring because of the business model, right? So even with cable news and cable television, we measure ratings because the ratings are the way that they value the ad placements. Because how popular something is, is what determines how much money people are willing to spend to get placements on that particular thing. Right, so, um, so we're not measuring how trustworthy the news organization is, how reliable it is, how high quality it is, how good is the writing, how thought provoking is it? Those are a lot harder to measure, but those are things that could be measured. Like part of me wants, I, I've been envisioning what is a, a new 21st century response to our broken information ecosystem? Like, can somebody make a, news organization that is sort of a meta news organization where, first of all, we're not going to, we're going to slow news down. We're not going to be rushed. It's not going to be trying to fill the data void and get something in the first thing on Twitter so that it, it propagates out fast. We're going to do thoughtful, reflective news analysis. And by the way, please pay us. Here's your $10 monthly subscription to get news that you actually genuinely trust that's giving you a perspective and a landscape of this is what the new york times said this is what fox news said this is what the ap said around a particular story right like that's something that just seems really really like i would put money into that i would be a customer i'd want thoughtful reflective slowed down news analysis where i would want my i, I would want to fill out surveys around how trustworthy is this news organization and let that be the metric that's driving the direction of the entity, right? So that's that's one thing. But but I think this taps into a bigger issue that my I, I am feeling very optimistic in that our youth, the millennials, and and more particularly Gen Z, is fed up with the status quo in countless different arenas, and that the consequences of neoliberal capitalism are no longer what what Gen Z wants. Um, and what we're what we need to move towards, where CSR is like an inherent part of any business. We're seeing that slowly with the environmental movement and how companies, in some cases, companies are greenwashing, but in other cases, companies are just genuinely trying to do more sustainable options because they recognize that is our responsibility as a company and that is what the public wants. We need that equivalent for all industries, right? Um, there's a friend of mine, Tom Chi, who has this great mindset. Um, we should not be, companies should only be making things that are earth digestible, that you buy things that are earth digestible. And if they are not earth digestible, they should not be for sale, that the company has a responsibility to collect them back and to use them again, right? So this phone should not be on a one-way path from Apple to me to the dumpster. This phone should be owned by Apple, and when I'm done with it, it's Apple's responsibility to take this back and to recycle and reuse these limited resources so that it goes back into some other product, that the recycling and the breaking down is built in, the, the needs are built in. Um, I often think about, um, okay, so if you look at the EPA and the failures of, uh, of our governmental systems to regulate environmental harms, 
we have the system where I, I think it makes sense for the individual where we are innocent until proven guilty. I believe that for corporations, that model should be flipped and we should have a guilty until proven innocent mindset. And okay, here's a particular company that works in a particular industry. And we're going to assume the worst case scenario. We're going to assume you're spilling this amount of chemicals and these are your emissions and these are X, Y, and Z. And we're going to assume that that is your annual footprint on the planet. And you as a corporation can demonstrate and prove and earn your tax credits by demonstrating that you're going above and beyond that worst case scenario and prove to us that you're not spilling those chemicals, that you're not emitting that carbon, that you're not emitting that methane or the greenhouse gases, that you're taking a closed loop circular economy system into account. And based on your demonstration and show us your receipts, we will then give you your tax credits. And if the system is designed right, the money still works out the same, right? It's the incentive to do the right thing as opposed to a minimal disincentive to avoid the wrong thing, right? The, the, the math and economics are just misaligned. Like it is just financially profitable for a company to take a gamble and to take a risk because the chance of them getting caught is low and the scale of the penalty is low such that the calculus just necessitates that's the right business move. Like that, that has to be flipped, right? So I, I am optimistic as, as Paul was saying, we're seeing the failures of capitalism. Like capitalism literally cannot going on like this forever because we're going to destroy the people on the planet that it, that it depends on, right? And so I have, my, my faith and my optimism is that cap capitalism itself is on a self-destructive path right now. It is on an unsustainable path that can't continue the status quo. The question and the unfortunate part of this is that how much human suffering and destruction and how much disproportionate suffering is going to happen in the process of a breakdown of this capitalist system that will then allow some type of rebirth to come. My hope is that that rebirth comes with the right people at the table, with the right thinking and the right leadership that says, look, how do we design a system that works for people on the planet, that works for all humanity, that, that takes everybody into account and is working on sustainable regenerative circular economy principles so that we can continue this, this grand human experiment for hopefully a longer amount of time. Like that, that's the thing where I hope we can get to that point. Um, I, I just don't know how much human suffering and how many lives are going to be lost in the process to get there. I, my, my optimism comes from my pessimism. And I do believe we're going to lose lots of people. And I don't know if it's you know, how many billions of people are going to suffer or face loss of life in this process of moving humanity to a regener regenerative and sustainable system. But, but my long-term optimism is that that day will come where we will rebuild a system that works based on the laws of nature and the laws of physics and the laws of humanity and how we operate with each other, that, that it will allow for a better future for future generations to come. Some of uh, what you're talking on, Jeff, here segues really nicely into another question. But Paul, sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, I'm just, uh, Jeff, I want to make sure just to be respectful of your time. Are we, what's your hard stop just to, so we can um, kind of get maybe, a sense? Maybe at the 20 minute mark, I do, I have to just like eat lunch before my next gotcha. like live <laughs> thing um, at okay. the hour mark. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, yeah. So, so maybe like at the 25 minute, I can push to that maybe. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. So, so Nick, go for it. I just wanted to make sure we're, we're just. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, yeah. I can of, talk uh, all day long, so I appreciate yeah. the, the time checks. No, thank you, Paul, for that. And PSA, lunch is, <laughs> lunch is important. Everyone, please eat lunch. Uh, so this kind of segues nicely into a question from our own social media manager here at the Rail, uh, JC. I will pass the mic over to you. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Jeff and Paul. This conversation has been incredible. Um, I. I the Jeff I watched I watched the film a couple weeks ago and like I think the film does a lot of things really really well in terms of um, reframing the way that we kind of generally think about and talk about social media in a way that felt really like true to my experience of spending intentionally like too many hours a day on it. Um, well. I had one kind of like there's one thing that sort of stuck out to me and I'm just kind of curious yeah, about please. the about the choice behind this. Towards the end of the film, um, some of the, the characters discuss social media's role in the global destabilization of democracies. 
which is super real and we're like watching it happen and it's like literally global. Um, that section is accompanied by footage, by like protest footage. Um, mm -hmm. There were some of the Gilet Jean and, and um, Black Lives Matter protests in Los Angeles and in Portland that stood out to me kind of in particular. And, you know, I, I, I guess my, my, my question is sort of like, or sorry, I'll, I'll keep going. The, um, the, the footage kind of like functions as evidence for the argument that social media is changing our behavior in ways that we're not aware of, um, which is true. But then having that protest footage as, as sort of the visual kind of yeah. like glosses over the fact that there are very real reasons. Yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. Changed. Um, so yeah, basically, and also I guess the, the fact that the, the, any, the, the kind of like economic inequality that we're seeing is driven by these very same tech platforms. Um, so yeah. Right, right. No, it's a great question. Um, and and I, I appreciate the, the time and space to go into the nuance of this. I, I think the point that we were trying to bring there, regardless of my political activism or your political activism or anything that any one of us is in pursuit of, um, I want us to recognize that these systems are in, in many ways taking all of those, um, uh, any of those ideas, concepts, um, causes, and adding polarization to them. And despite what I might want to root for personally, there is a system at play that is adding polarization to that issue. That, that's really the hope that I'm trying to draw. And, and let's bring up um, BLM as an example in that um, some research has come out over the course of this summer where uh, the majority of Americans are in support of Black Lives Matter as a movement. Yet 70% of the conversation on Facebook about Black Lives Matter is actually critical and dismissive of Black Lives Matter as a movement. So we might be in a particular bubble that has a particular mindset around what progressive values looks like or what the future we want to look like, what we want our future to look like is, et cetera. And the, we might hear a, a resounding echo chamber and filter bubble around a particular cause and a particular movement, yet for every movement, there is an opposing movement that is also being algorithmically amplified. And that's really the hope that I want to, to draw us to, that it might seem like we are in a shared conversation, yet there is equal opposition happening. And we are seeing that despite this summer and the, the, the in my mind, great progress being made on Black Lives Matter as a movement, we're still not seeing political action. We're still not seeing results and we're seeing opposition and tension arising in, in many of those same arenas. So I, I, I think that that's, um, I hope this gets to the, the heart of your question around, it's, it doesn't matter what I care about or what you care about in that the system is going to take anything and look for something that can polarize. I, I look at it as a system that looks for any crack in society and is gonna grow the wedge where like that's just what does better for the business model as opposed to a circle where we're all like together in a shared community. It's like, well, if I pull this person out this way, that increases engagement and that increases engagement and that increases engagement. And so now from away from a, what is culture other than a shared story? We've gone from a shared story to an infinite number of customized stories. Right. We are literally, these algorithms are literally breaking down culture and going to greater extremes. And, and so that's that's sort of how I, I think of it and the, the usage of that footage. That that makes sense to me. I guess I guess the the, the jump that I that I didn't make in my question is like the the one kind of the thing that that both sides of these like amplified movements mm -hmm. are are struggling with is the class struggle, right? And that's the yes. one oh, yeah, yeah. that's the one struggle that, that like is that like it seems like it's harder to drive a stake in that one. Um, right. And the film didn't really go there, but I also understand that's like a different set of politics. Yeah, um, you're, you're raising a great point. I, I haven't yet read the book Cast. That's very, very high on my list. I'm, I'm very interested in reading that and to kind of dive into this more. Um, I, I think the class struggle is tapping back into the capitalist, like the consequences of capitalism that we've been talking through. I mean, you look at the stock market this year and you look at how the average American is doing and like things are only like inequality is just on this crazy trajectory right now where um, 
I don't know, maybe uh, maybe there's more to offline on that or resources to read and share. Um, there's definitely a film or a dozen in the subject matter that you're tapping into, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, JC. And thanks for that too. I mean, Nick, um, given that we have about five minutes left, anybody, you, do you want to do it any type of closing? I see Glide, Glide's hand has been raised and I've been seeing that pop up a bunch of times. I, I don't know if we, yeah, I'll let you guys determine the timing, but I just wanted to acknowledge it. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I think that uh, I know we are running out of time. We have about five minutes. Um, I actually, I, I want to thank everyone for all of your questions and I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them. Um, but uh, I think our final is going to come from our own Fong Bui. Fong, I think you can activate your mic. Can we, just out of curiosity, can we split a, if Glide, because I know Glide has had their hand up a lot. Is there a way maybe to just give them a really brief thing just out of respect because, you know, just time yeah. and space and then then Fong just to kind of, you know, democratization. Um, is that is that OK? Because uh, they did have their Let's, hand we'll, up. We'll go really so. fast. Let's do both. Okay. Let's go fast. Thanks. So. Thank you. And it's positive it. um, because ultimately I've been trying to conci be concise about what I'm saying, but how can we reclaim our attention? And then I was trying to answer my own question with things that we've been talking about or you've been talking about with other things. Um, and yeah, and, and I'm thinking, is it reclaiming our humanity? Because these algorithms are going to do yes. their thing, and then you're you're saying that they're versions, they're they're versions of us, and they don't necessarily have to be bad. They're just doing what they're programmed to do. Right. Um, so how can we be as human as possible? And uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that is. It's it's uh, one of our subjects says that these platforms have cleaved our attention from our intention. And how do we bring back our intention? Um, so it taps into a mindfulness conversation as well. But um, as you're saying, also bringing back our humanity. Um, Tristan, their team uh, have this this pin, Team Humanity, that I've just always loved because that is their mindset. It's like we are on the same team. And what does Team Humanity need to do to increase and improve the abilities and the ways in which we relate to each other? I, I think this is where. Um, I'm not a programmer, and uh, if, if anybody was, there's a huge opportunity for a new social media platform or many new social media platforms to come about that are really focused on humanity. Like, imagine if there was a system that had, you know, within the Dunbar number, within, like, I've got me and my eight closest friends are in a group, and we went to this platform to help guide us through life and through the challenges, and hey, the, this is like, I, I have friends who are in a men's group and this was part of the, the thinking and inspiration for what could technology do in a similar way that models also like bring us around a council fire kind of mindset too, where look, this is a group of close friends. This is what we're struggling with. Can technology guide us to having shared deep conversation? Can technology guide us around influences, questions, things to read, th ways to probe us? Imagine social media that made you feel better after you used it. Imagine like, just like this, I feel, I feel more human because of this conversation, right? I feel um, the, the exchange of ideas, the conversation, I wish we had a lot more time, right? Um, and how do, how do we build technology platforms that are structured and incentivized around that? Um, I would pay for that technology too, right? I would pay for something that deepened my relationships with my friends and family. Um, and did it in a remote way. Like there's a huge opportunity for something like that. So yeah, team humanity. Yeah, and I, I just feel bad for these robots because it's sort of like creating Dr. Frankenstein, you know, right. Facebook and Google are Dr. Frankenstein and yeah. these little robots have no feelings, but they're just doing their algorithms and we have all these feelings, but yet we're trying to be like them. It doesn't make any sense. So right. right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's all bots all the way down. You know, there used to be this thing. You know, it's it's turtles all the way down. Now you can just say it's it's just bots. But um, bots. all right. So Nick, uh, Bong, closing remarks with with Jeff. And Jeff, by the way, thank you so much for making the time too, man. Yes. I really no, thank it. you, thank you um, all. Think, yeah, yeah. You got you have a new fan base of art world folks. Oh, um, awesome. Yes. And yes, um, so Fong, is, I, is he still around? He's I'm probably here. wearing some crazy um, sunglasses or something. Can you guys right, hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I watched the movie thank the other you. night, and it was something that we've been already 
thought about at the rail since the beginning. The idea is, you know, I remember in college reading um, Astro Powell and somewhere he say, one would never understand a deep book until you have lived at least one of his chapter, mm. you know? So mm -hmm. I think that, that being conformist um, as a potential um, given in to the certain South by culture, the spoon fed culture has been with us mm -hmm. a long time. I think that somehow the, the end of the Cold War, we all fell asleep at the wheel. And I think that September 11 gave more power um, to the greater fear and therefore technology um, became so frenziedly occupied a certain kind of condition in our social life. And I remember talking to my friend, David Levi Strauss about how Akeda were able to use technology, talk about low technology, buying a phone, flip phone, in the daily in the mornings, talking a few hours, throw it away, buy a new, another one, mm. and communicate, able to, to basically attack America for the first time, taking down the Twin Towers. So technology can be used subversively if there yeah. is a real intention. It's no more, no less than when Mussolini meeting the founder of futurism, futurist art after the first war uh, in 1914, Maretti, you know? And basically what you think about futurist art is, is technology and speed. I mean, I think that art artists have to remain <clears throat> subversive and very nonconformist as a position in society. Therefore, we need to cultivate the margin in the edges of society, not in the center. And I think that's exactly what we must do and work together. So a film as yours, uh, Social Dilemma, I have pointed out that possibility because we don't need to be an expert of technology in order to defeat technology. That's another yeah. option I'm thinking of, right, Paul? I mean, I think yeah. artists think of all the inventive ways. I mean, I, for the first time I have an iPhone, I didn't have it for a long time. So creating a, a platform like this, having you coming over, joining us anytime is a way to amplify social intimacy, social closeness, not social distancing. And right. I think that's way that, that that's another, you know, uh, effective way of mobilize what we call culture and humanity. And this is what it counts. So thank you so much for yes. spending awesome. time with us, Jeff. Thank, thank you. you, Paul. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, and J Jeff, um, well, I guess by way of closure, because I know, I, you know, we're going to just transition. Oh, we're losing you, Paul. Yeah, Paul, sorry, you're, you're, you're breaking up. Um, but to uh, pick up on that. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in the mountains. Okay. We got you no, back. Sorry. Got you back. This was the door. Yeah, the door is always open. <laughs> psychedelic way of saying it <laughs> yeah um i think we, we got that so thanks paul Jeff, yep. thank you hopefully you guys are hearing that but um yeah thanks. yeah thank you so much to... <laughs> paul. yeah but i want to thank you jeff again right. for, for joining us so today. that's it and all right um today so uh i'm gonna just type this thanks everyone signal <laughs> is... <laughs> um, I... Jeff, enjoy your lunch. Let's just enjoy the rest. Thank of your you day. all. Uh, but it is a real tradition that we end our events with a poetry reading. I'm thank. That's awesome. It's sure. great. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, thank you, Nick. Uh, Absolutely. I will. I will mute myself um, and enjoy the sign out. Amazing. Uh, thank you again. I would love to now introduce our poet, and that poet is Lawrence Griffin. Uh, just a quick bio before I pass the mic over to Lawrence. Lawrence Griffin's most recent book, Untitled 2004, is a long poem that takes Agnes Martin's final painting as an occasion for a meditation on death and birth, history and chance, love and exploitation, all addressed to his newborn daughter, Agnes. He is co-editor at Goliath Books. Lawrence, the stage is now yours. Thank you, Nick, and thanks to the Brooklyn Rail for having me, and thanks to Paul and 
Jeff, for a really stimulating conversation. I really enjoyed the social dilemma. I watched it a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna read just a small portion from this book, which is one long poem. Um, and I just, there's a mention of a splotch in it. I wonder if this will come up. This is Angus Martin's last painting, and this is the splotch right there. Just a little detail, just so you know what I'm talking about when I mention it. Um, yeah, so I'll just begin and uh, should be qu quite short. Sometime after having finished what will become her last painting, Martin made a drawing, also her last, a few inches in size of a potted plant, which also has the name Untitled 2004. Representational, the drawing seems unprecedented in Martin's career. A thin, unbroken line traces the basic shape of leaves and vessel, like a blind contour drawing. The line wavers, seems little more than the record of a spasm. A second, much shorter line starts in the midst of the leaves, moving vertically, unsteadily, then loops back on itself, suggestive of a stem and a bud, which if drawn from life, she would never see bloom. While the blossom buds forth, the leaves that prepare the blossom now fall off. The fruit comes to light while the blossom disappears. This means that to live is to follow a path that in making its way makes way and makes a way for that which doesn't know it waits to be, however impatiently. And our mighty works fail to flower if they don't contain within themselves the germ of their own corruption, a splotch you might say. That's how the flower appears to the ripening fruit, the fruit to the still closed bud. The future is before all else yet to be. The image of achieved perfection can only take the form of a mistake, so our might and purity will be realized in its undoing. The splotch in Martin's painting, which now looks to me like a flower pressed to wet paint, is the equivalent of the bud in her final drawing, which rises like a little balloon tied to its own separate line the same way death tracks a line perpendicular to that of the life that it completes by interrupting it. Putting all this stuff, all these corpuscles writing to you on a different trajectory. No one can follow that line, just as your mother and I can't follow you, dear Agnes. As you bud forth, we wither away. Wherever the splotch appears, it should be named as such. Ceylon has a line that goes, the name gilds the faints. It means a word is not a stand-in, but instead is the ruse behind which what is named is able to escape. The name adorns a vacancy, a vanity, and doing so imports this dupery, unites us to the world as fool to knave. We are not argued, but seduced into existence. We suffer into being, and everything else just gilds this fact, although more often than not as disavowal of what the name and failing therefore names. But even then, the mad desire to master and possess nature, to ground what is on ground that is not ash and dust, bears a trace of first dependency ill met. Agnes, I know almost nothing, and it has taken me nearly 40 years to learn how dumb I've always been. So what advice could I give you about making your way in a world that as I write is being manufactured expressly to be unfit for human life? Any advice would outdate on the lips, but what you must bear you will because you are already perfectly imperfect. And this is your strength because it's the how and why of things to be ad hoc and provisional. So if all this must boil down to some pithy advice, let me simply say of your peculiar imperfection, whatever it turns out to be, that you should never make excuses for it and never should you trade your unapologetic predilections for the efficacy of explanations. Defend your right to be unfinished. Defend whatever in this life preempts supremacy because life is weakness and vulnerability and dependence. Life is mutant and improvised and accidental. And though it has always enlisted fear, it has yet bred fear's opposite, which is love, the most improbable thing in the universe, which no one understands and probably does not exist. Though if it does, it will debride your armored essence, leaving behind a stain which you will have to offer others as a vain thing to be loved, a splotch in which to find an endless life, one of purpose disyoked, a meaningless means to no end. Love can't see farther than one inch in front of its face. It's useless for doing anything, but in the end, what use are you? What are any of us for? 
Surely not for love, since love is nothing but the mark of our basic uselessness. So you must let love pick apart your, pick apart your composure. Why? For no reason, because I said so. Let love reject all conditions, and to the extent it fails to live up to its own harsh demands, it will lead you to agree to the possibility of your ruin, and to follow as it lets what must die pass away in peace, in order just for love to be at all. Thank you. The room echoes with virtual claps. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, to echo what GE said in the chat, that was beyond ekphrastic. <laughs> that was a beautiful way to end this conversation today. Thank you so much, Jeff, for making yourself available. Congratulations on the film. I recommend thank you, everyone, everyone. everyone go to Netflix and watch it. Uh, thank you, Paul, for joining us today and everyone for your questions and really thoughtful engagement in the chat. Uh, I want to just take a very quick moment to say that October marks the 20th anniversary of the Brooklyn Rail. So this is our celebration month. I'm very happy to be sharing it with all of you and to, for the rail to be committed to remaining independent, free, and accessible to everyone. Uh, we do this every day at 1 p.m. Please join us on Monday for a conversation with artist Jeffrey Gibson, co-hosted with Amber Jamila Musser and myself. We'll conclude a poetry reading from Eleanor Noun. Uh, everyone, you, I believe, have the option to unmute yourselves and say ciao on your way out and have a beautiful weekend, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Beautiful reading. What a profound way to Beautiful. end the week. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank Please you, Serena, for your question. Yes, absolutely. GE, e, hello. Thank you, GE. Thank you, GE. Thank you, Serena. Thank you, you all.